Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 331, and I had a conversation with Joel Green. Joel is a retired professional basketball player, the founder of Pro Level Training, the national director of Nike Sports Camps, an educator, speaker, and author of the book Filtering, The Way to Extract Strength from Struggle. We talked about his childhood, growing up in Philadelphia in a tight-knit faith-based family, the violence he experienced firsthand in his neighborhood, and tragedy nearly broke him, but ultimately it pushed him to find his greatest self, as well as really pushed him into his work now, uh, and it determined his path in life, I think. And as he now shapes young minds and athletes and helps them realize that from their obstacles and failures comes wisdom and strength. So I'm excited for you to hear this. For more episodes like this one, check out episode 32 with Brett Swain, episode 69 with Nikki Damour, episode 90 with Elisa Iancone, episode 118 with Evander Holyfield, episode 158 with James Dixon, and episode 268 with Shirley Wainess. Looking for older episodes of Hey Human? Great news! Apple Podcasts now shows all the episodes, along with Blurby.com and, of course, HeyHumanPodcast.com. All these websites have every episode from the last six years, so even if your app that you listen to podcasts doesn't hold more than 300, you can go to those other places and find every episode from the very beginning. Yay! In other news, check out heyhumanpodcast.com for links that will let you deep dive to learn more about my guests and the show in general, susanruth.com to learn about me, and please follow Susan Ruthism and Hey Human Podcast on social media. Also, check out my new relationships and sex show, Are We There Yet?, with sexologist and healthcare practitioner Mara Edelman. It's on YouTube under youtube.com slash are we there yet podcast show. Thanks for listening, everyone. Be love, be the light, be the change, be the hope. Take care of each other. All right, here we go. Joel Green, welcome to Hey Human Podcast. Susan, thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. I want to start with your where you came from. Where, where'd you grow up? What was family life like? It was, uh, you know, it was different. It was something that I actually enjoyed. It was difficult, but the fact that I just didn't know any other lifestyle, I I actually enjoyed much of, you know, how I grew up. It was difficult. Like I said, it was challenging. It was dangerous at different points. Um, so I can only imagine how my parents felt and my older siblings. I'm the youngest of four. You know, we, we grew up in an abandoned house in North Philadelphia. So, I mean, that that right there was just a challenge. I felt the challenges again. Although I said I enjoyed it, I knew I felt the challenges. I saw what it was about. And you know, we had holes in our staircase that we would kind of make games around, playing hopscotch around the holes. And, you know, we had mice often and, you know, things like that. And I, I knew what it was. We had graffiti on some of our walls because, again, it was, it was an abandoned home when we moved into it. And so it was the house right next to us. And, you know, it was violent in the area. And I was close to a shooting, about 10 feet away from a shooting when I was six years old. And I was the only person there outside of the kid that got shot and the two shooters. And, you know, going through tumultuous things like that and traumatizing things like that, it was, it was difficult. Um, but it made me who, who I am today. And, it helped me to develop a callus toward different evils in the world and just difficulties in the world. So um, I don't complain that often. Honestly, I don't complain. So you're saying y'all moved in because it was abandoned. So your family could move into there. Yeah. So the city used to have what's called dollar homes. I think you purchased from, from the city for a dollar, you know, this, and um, if I'm not mistaken, we moved in the year that I was born. So in 1985, we moved in. And, it, and this was also during, you know, during the crack era of the late 80s, early 90s. And so it was just a difficult time where we lived. And I I go there often, you know, once or twice every year. You know, I just drive past. I'll sit just outside of the house and just think. And uh, it reminds me of where I come from. I It just makes me appreciate life. And I was over there. Man, this may have been two months ago. Honestly. Looks like someone did a little work on it, but part of it still looks abandoned. And the house next to it is still abandoned. And this is 
30 years later, 30 plus years later. How many years did you live in that house? About eight years. So you have pretty distinctive memories from uh, then. That was my childhood. I mean, I, 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 that was, when I think of my childhood, I think of North Philadelphia. I think of that house. Um, and that was, you know, uh, it was, a, again, it was a fun time because that was all I knew. But it was a dangerous time. I experienced things that I wouldn't wish on anybody to experience, going to sleep to gunshots in the distance and, you know, hearing people argue up the street and stuff like that and seeing, you know, crack vials on the street. I didn't know what they were when I was five or six, but I knew I did, you know, I knew after a while they were drug oriented. And this, this, you shouldn't even know what drugs are, you know, to that extent at that age. But I knew that they were, you know, drugs or something like that and um that was that was my life you know we we adapted to it you know we wore donated clothes from the church and that was what we adapted to we that was our life that was our lifestyle and your family wasn't as close it's, oh we've always been close yeah my family were super tight-knit and that's that's what allowed us to to get out of it you know our parents from the top on down to me being the youngest of, of four it was six of us all in the same house, you know, and, um, you know, depending on how much kerosene we had, we actually slept in the same bed together, you know, all six of us. And uh, if we only had enough kerosene for one heater. All right, cool. It's going to be our parents' heater. We're going to sleep in our parents' room. And um, again, me being the youngest, didn't always see the difficult side of things. Mm. I just was always, you know, following the pack, following the crowd, following instruction. and. And just enjoying life as, me- as best as I could. The older I got, I really appreciated what my parents did for us. You know, the, the perspective that they carried, all that they were instilling us on purpose with true intent. I'm talking about we would sit down and watch documentaries and they would talk to us afterward and say, hey, this is why we watch it. Know that there's, there's places beyond where we are. Like, we, you know, we would have little sit downs. So, you know, it, it helped. Do you talk to your parents now about how it all was then? And now that you have a perspective of the big world and seeing the difference between the haves and the have nots and the opulence and the the fact that many of us are quite soft, given that it's easy. Yeah, I I speak to them often about it. Uh, You know, I just released my first book about two weeks ago. And, you know, I include in the introduction. You know, you know, growing up in that condition, growing up in an abandoned home and just different things I went through at that age. And um, even after we moved, you know, I had a knife pulled out on me, you know, at nine years old and just different things that we went through. I, I talk about that with my parents now. They said they there's stories that I put in the book. They said we had no clue you even went through. And, you know, racism that I went through at seven years old and, and you know, we're in a neighborhood and there was an older white gentleman walking his dogs and. Me and my brother were in the parking. He was looking at a stranger. He told both of his pit bulls, sick him. He let the go, let, leash, let both of his leashes go, and they chased us. And, and fortunately, you know, we made it to a, a fence of an old tennis court, and we scaled it. And he just let the dogs bark up at us, and, you know, until he called him away. And he just walked, he kind of like smirked and walked off. And That's terrifying. Right. I was, I was seven years old. My brother was about... 10 or 11 when that happened and we both just you know i almost got caught by the dog my brother got away a lot faster he was bigger you know at, at around 11 years old but they were on me you know i heard them just breathing hard and chasing me behind me and it was it was terrifying but you know going through things like that it, again it built me up it built me up like you say you know some people may be considered soft because they didn't go through different things early in life I have a callus toward evil. So I have a callus toward, you know, hardship to where when I see hardship, I'm not going to complain about it. I'm going to make an adjustment and adapt and overcome the hardship as opposed to saying, oh, man, this is going to hold me down. No, it's not. I've already been through tougher. I've had it. I've lost one of my siblings, you know, tragically like I I've been through stuff to where. I saw life early. Right. So. I said, okay, I'm not going to sit here and complain about this thing that I'm fortunate to have. What happened to your brother? 
when I was uh, 17, he, he, he drowned, you know, mm -hmm. uh, tragically. And he was only 25. You know, him, he and his fiance were away on a trip. And, you know, we, we got a, a call that I'll never forget. Um, and we raced to go meet him and hopefully save him. Um, you know, unfortunately, it didn't happen. Yeah, tough situation to where it really, again, it showed me again what life was all about. I just had to really start to figure things out for myself as, as a as a person, as, you know, as a young man, just saying, OK, this thing, li life is serious, it's real, you know. Um, how do I use these things that I'm going through as opposed to just crying about them, you know, um, which I've done. You know, I'm human and, you know, uh, I've shut down, especially when my brother passed, I, I shut down and then talked to anyone for weeks, but I had to end up figuring out, okay, I can use this stuff. At that point, how old were you? I was 17, just turned 17 around the time. I was, yeah, just turned 17 the month prior and, um, my senior year of high school. And it was you know, a big transition time for me. My brother was a big catalyst. He started me off in basketball. You know, I became a pro. You know, he was the one that gave me the nicknames that I had growing up at the playground and stuff like that. He he would take me to the park and we'd play. He would show me different things. So for me, it was a huge blow, obviously, as my brother, but even beyond that, also as a, as a friend, as a trainer, you know, as a basketball buddy. You know, he's got me into trading cards when we were younger, when I was a big thing. And I had nobody to, you know, I have, I still have another brother and an older sister, but you have a different relationship with each. And I lost that, which, which hurt and still hurts, to be honest. You know, I, I have moments to where that happened in 2002. It's 20 years later. And I feel it just as hard. Um, but again, those are the things to where I now use that stuff. Again, my book is called Filtering, The Way to Extract Strength from the Struggle. And that, that method helps me that I came up with to where I use that. I use the pain. I use the, the anger, the sadness. I draw the energy from those things and I apply them somewhere productive. So, you know, albeit there are unfortunate circumstances, I figure why not grow as a result of them. Oh, I hate that you had to go through that. I'm sorry for that loss. Of no, your thank you. I appreciate that. What's his name? Kevin. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I appreciate that. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you talk about these events that happened to you as a kid, and then as I mean, I consider seventeen a kid too. And yeah, that's, you're exactly. still a kid, exactly. and the keeping that stuff to yourself for the experience with the dog or the knife, as you said, and and then all the stuff our parents don't know. We think about <laughs> right. parents as the ones protecting us, but really. We protect our parents from so much of the stuff we experience. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's and my brothers even told me different things. Like, hey, don't don't tell mommy and daddy. You know, don't, don't say anything. And you know, like I they didn't this yeah, just a few things. I, I just I know my parents as well, you know, especially my father. Like he's like, What? What happened? Is that he may want to go out and do something, you know, as a protective, you know, being as I am with my, you know, my child. So it was a plenty of things that we went through as kids. We said, oh, don't say anything once we get home, you know, because uh, we're trying to protect them and just give them some peace of mind. Like, hey, everything is OK. You know, as so. you're a kid and you're and you're developing your mindset. And as you say, now you use that steel as a way to focus and move forward and push yourself. Mm -hmm. But when you're a kid, that's that's a lot to throw at someone. Did you have that, the mindset you have now? Did you have it then too? Were you just sort of born into it or did it develop over time? That's a lot of trauma. Yeah, it definitely developed over time. Uh, initially, what I would do was I would do things to distract myself. It wasn't really that I was trying to use what happened against itself, but I would do things to take my mind off of what I've experienced. So I would just create stuff. You know, I, I made my own board game and I would just, I, I, I used to make homes. I used to want to be an architect. So I just would have all these creative activities and these outlets to where I would just be doing things and I wouldn't have to think about certain things. And it helped. Um, then it wasn't until my brother passed to where my own, one of my uncles told me, no, you, 
you got to keep living, man. I know you, you, you've been laying down for the last two weeks. You ain't go to school and you, you don't want to talk to anybody. And people were, were coming to our house to just make sure I was okay. And I didn't want to talk to anybody, you know, um, my friends, my close, I had two close friends, Julius and Malcolm, and they, they came to my house for days. And, you know, my mom would tell me, Hey, they're downstairs again. I'm like, no, I don't want to come down. You want them to come up now, you know, and we were friends since middle school. And at this point, you know, we've been friends for about five or six years at this point. I'm like, I don't want to see anybody. And and my uncle told me one day he came over, he came up to my room. I think I even said, I didn't want him to come up, but he came up (laughs) and uh, he sat on my bed while I was laying on my stomach, facing my pillow. And I'm like, I'm talking to him like that tears running. He said, he got his hand on my back. He prayed for me. It was like, you got to live, man. You got to live. You're still here. Like you're the one that's actually still here. So, you know, that helped me a lot. And he said, you got to do for Kevin the things that he's been telling you to do. So, you know, my brother told me, pick your grades up, man. Come on. Do your thing on the court. Get that scholarship we, you've been talking about. So I started working my behind off. I used his his death as motivation to say, all right, I'm going to own up to this promise I'm making to him. I'm going to get my grades up. I made the honor roll for the first time in my life. It took me 12 years of schooling to do it. But months after he passed, I, I made the honor roll for the very first time and graduated with honors from high school. And had by the time I graduated, had multiple Division One full scholarship offers in basketball. And I, I discovered then, OK, I can actually use the darkness against itself and have it cancel it out and actually have that turn into light and help, help me shine. Your dad's a pastor, correct? My dad's a pastor, yeah. Growing up with faith in the house mm-hmm. and then having all this stuff happen around you, how did that develop your relationship with God, if you have one now? I, I definitely still do. Definitely still do. It helped me, you know, so much, you know. I realize, you know, life in itself is is, is a huge thing to bear all on your own. So for me, it helped me hand off a lot. Yeah, I didn't want to have to carry this weight of life and and be so overwhelmed by it. For lack of a better term, I dump the stuff off on God. Like, God, you got it. Orchestrate the stuff for me, please. You know, I don't want to have to orchestrate it. I don't want to have to be the manager of it. I'll manage what I can. Place on my table what I can manage. And what I've realized is, I believe it's 2 Corinthians I may be wrong in saying 417, but it talks about light afflictions, you know, and it says light afflictions are here, but for a moment, they worketh for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. And I think about that often because it's a portion that I don't hear people talk about that with that scripture. It says worketh for us. So these afflictions, these difficulties, they were here working for us. They're assisting us. And that helped me to come to a revelation recently, actually, that I was just discussing earlier today with someone and letting them know that I feel like we all feel like we've been put here to make all the bad stuff good, to improve this stuff. But I think it's in reverse. I think that so much of the bad stuff that's here is actually here to help us become better, Mm -hmm. to help improve us. You know, if we just dare embrace the bad stuff, the difficult times, embrace the difficulties, and lean into them as opposed to run away from them and dismiss them or even again, trying to improve them, allow them to refine us. And I, you know, the difficulties has turned my perspectives around so much to where I now can actually see things from multiple angles and have empathy toward others, even that may hate me. Yeah. That even though they might hate you, that's an interesting way to put it. I, you know, all over the news these days, there are those who say, oh, racism doesn't exist in America, which of course is ridiculous. Of course it does. <laughs> As a kid growing up, I'm sure your parents had the talk with you. Mm-hmm. You know, you're black, therefore people are going to treat you differently. Yep. Police will treat you differently. And as you said, you know, just a guy walking a dog, yep. sicking them on children. So how did that language evolve in your house? How did you how did you grow up with that conversation? We were taught the facts. 
nothing was hidden. Nothing was hidden. We would sit down. And again, our, our parents were super intentional, like super intentional, you know, about showing us what the world was about, letting us know this exists, right? This is how things were when we were younger. Here's how they are now. Okay. Be aware of that. And we, we will watch, I never forget when I was probably about seven or eight, we watched Eye on a Prize, a documentary, and we watched this documentary, we watched different movies and they let us know what it was. And we, we would have talks afterward. It was, again, they, it were, they were intentional. This were, these were lessons. It wasn't just family time. It was family time plus, you know, uh, education. And it helped us so much because we were not, we weren't blindsided by any of it. Obviously it was still surreal as we would experience different things. I went through something, actually gave a Ted talk on it, on a situation I went through when I was 19, you know, just a racial incident with an officer that pulled me over in South Carolina. It had nothing to do with anything that I did, you know, but it just was, fortunately he was called away because he, he ripped my shirt and, and, it was unnecessary. Um, and all he said I did was ran through a stop sign. Well, I didn't stop at a stop sign, which I actually had to stop at because it was a whole lot of traffic to even merge onto the lane. I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have me mistaken, but he took offense to everything that I said. And I was as respectful as I possibly could. He asked me to get out the car and it, it turned south after that. Again, surreal going through them, but not surprised by them. For a lot of people, it may have been surprised. I wasn't surprised, but I'm like, and again, it's funny during, not funny, but my cousin, one of my cousins, uh, my female cousins were in the car. My girlfriend at the time was in the car. We were all on vacation with my, my family, but we, just the three of us went bowling this one night away from our resort. And in the car, I said, don't tell my parents. I, I was just in that mode of still just, protecting. Want, yeah. Yeah. I'm protecting my cousins. I'm protecting my parents. And I just wanted us to enjoy the vacation. My parents didn't know for years. They didn't know until, man, maybe just before I gave a TED talk. So for over a decade, they didn't know. And um, it was just things I, I, I retained and kept to myself because of who I was. I had a wall up when it came to things to expression and you know people probably wouldn't believe it now the fact that i'm so vocal from the stage and i'm vocal on platforms like your show but i had to really work on expressing myself but once i began doing it i saw how therapeutic it was i'm like this feels good and plus i saw how impactful it, and fruitful it was for those receiving the words i realized i didn't go through all this stuff for myself like i went through it to help other people to say wow okay i'm not the only person going through something difficult i can actually make it out on the other side and stand up strong and still be confident as the person in front of me is and actually use this stuff as motivation it's got to be tough though man to not look at things and think what am i job here like, how much do i have one person have to endure mm -hmm. I mean, oh. I mean, seriously, I've had those moments. I've had those moments to where it's like, goodness gracious. But I've seen the cyclic pattern of, of, of my life um, and just life in general, not just my life. But I've seen that there's lessons that are trying to be taught to us through our situations. If we only are aware of them, then we can pick up on them. When we're not aware of them and we're so emotional amidst them, that emotion may generally, cl it'll cloud our judgment of that situation. And we only see the surface of that situation. We react to the surface of it and we never see what lies beneath the surface of that situation. That's where the answers are. That's where the lesson is. That's where the fruit is. But we only live on the surface of so many of our problems and our difficulties in those sudden life moments. When I said, I have to start leaning into my moments a little bit more and even leaning into past moments. I started seeing, okay, wow. I saw the duplicated lessons over time. It just had a different face to it, a different surface. So I'm like, ah, man, I could have got it then, but I didn't. Okay. And, but hindsight revealed so much to me. And 
again, I came up with this method for myself called filtering so that I don't have to wait on hindsight to reveal stuff. And I can actually start to develop some foresight saying, okay, I can actually see what's coming down a pike. Let me avoid this or make an adjustment to accept this or to embrace this and embrace myself for impact or stop this from think from occurring. It, did all that growth come post basketball or did it come while you were out doing the professional? Did you have time to think about that stuff? In other words, because I know that's a rigorous schedule to be right. a professional athlete. So much came after basketball, but quite a bit, quite a few things did come during. Because again, I had, I had difficulties and trials on the court as well, you know, just with coaches or school situations. I went to 14 different schools. You Whoa. Know? Right. So it was a lot of transition in my life from pre-K to graduate from college. I went to 14 different schools and I was not an army brat. So just with that movement and transition, I experienced a lot even before getting to professional basketball, just as far as making adjustments. There's a chapter, it's chapter number one, uh, called making adjustments or make the adjustment. And so I talk about the different, adjust, different adjustments I had to make in life, just with being around this group of people, then leaving them and making and being around that group of people. I, was, I didn't want to make friends after a while because I'm like, I want to leave them, you know? And I understood different things. I understood, fortunately, I understood why my parents were moving us around because look where we grew up. I grew up in an abandoned house. They didn't want us to stay there. You know, we moved and it wasn't still, it still wasn't an ideal setting. So we moved again. So I, I, I got it. It was just difficult for me at the time. And I didn't even express to my parents le until later that it was, just, it was tough. It was tough. They, my mom, she tells me, I, mean, I remember you didn't want to go out of the house when we moved to, uh, you know, where we were by the time you were nine years old. I said, I didn't trust anybody. I didn't trust any new people because, and it wasn't because of them, you know, it was, myself i'm like well i'm gonna get cool with you and i probably won't see you after a couple of years so i just kind of became a loner at that point i was never a loner before that when i when i was in north philly i was very social you know and just love to be out and about with people on the block once we moved to you know southwest philly i stayed in the house and just you know did a lot around the house a lot of creative stuff i would just go to the basketball court do my thing, practice a little bit, play with some some friends I did have or, you know, people I knew in the neighborhood and I would come back home. It would be me and my siblings and that would be it. Before Kevin passed, did you decide you wanted to do the basketball or was that really his influence? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was that was something I, I loved basketball since I was three years old. I mean, that was my thing. I knew that I wanted to make it to the NBA. I wanted to be like Michael Jordan. You know, I, I knew all that by the time I was six, right? And, you know, I, it was my favorite movie. It was a movie called Teen Wolf in the 80s with Michael J. Fox. You know, when I was three years old, I saw that movie. I remember watching it. I remember my, I can, I have memories, clear memories back when I was three years old. And so I watched it so much on VHS, you know, the tape messed up and it would be the tracking button and all that. I, we had to press a bunch of sounds, but I, I knew how to put the tape in a VCR. And I would sit, you know, my legs crossed and just watching the, the movie. So, yeah, that was, basketball, I knew what I wanted to do with it professionally um, at a young age. But Kevin had a huge influence on me and he taught me about basketball. So it wasn't just like playing the game, but he taught me the rules of it. I remember literally we would study basketball cards and different players on the cards. And we would have to me, him and my other brother, Eric, we would have literally a round table. We would get a new pack of basketball cards and we had to all study, study them. Then we would test each other of where the player, the player's name, full name, the, the cards usually had their middle name on it too. So we have to know the full middle name, place of birth, year of birth, and um, their college. We would sit around and test each other on all, we would give each other all time to study the same deck of cards and then we would test each other so i started learning basketball from a different way and we would talk about the skill set that the players had on the cards so kev he really he impacted me in a different way even off the court that translated on the court you were injured correct yeah mm -hmm. and that was that in college or was that in pro that was in college okay that was my freshman year my first year of college 
And it sounded by, I don't know a lot about all the particulars about basketball and what the rules are and things, but it sounded like your upbringing actually gave you the wherewithal to figure out how to not take a, a major injury and let it sideline you. Yeah. I mean, during that time, it's funny because I just mentioned, you know, uh, make the adjustment, right? I just mentioned that, that chapter in the book that came from when I was injured, you know, that term, make the adjustment, because when I was injured, I tore my hamstring, so I couldn't compete, you know, in a way that I wanted to, I had to sit out and watch practice. And there are, one of my coaches who happened to be the shooting coach for the team, the main shooting coach, he would take me into the gym and sit me in a chair because he didn't want me always standing up just to stay off of my hamstring. And he would do shooting practices with me, just sit down or stand still. He would allow me to stand up a lot of times, but not that often. And I would miss. He would always say these three letters, make the adjustment. And so, you know, I would make it, make it, make it. I would miss. All right, Joel, make the adjustment. I'm like, all right, I will straighten it back out and I would make it again. And so for me, that's it always stuck with me. You know, I took it outside. I took it off the court. You know, I, I saw how much it helped me on the court as far as just being aware of why your pitfalls may have occurred that I had control over, right? So everything you don't have full control over, but the things that I do control, I also have the ability to make an adjustment to make them better if they're not ideal. So I took that off the court with me for years to date. And again, that was when I was 19 years old. You know, I'm 37 now, so almost 20 years later, I'm still telling myself, make the adjustment. I hear his voice, you know, make the adjustment. Okay, this business move didn't go exactly how I wanted to. All right, Joe, make the adjustment, you know, go back at it. Don't give up on it just because you, quote unquote, failed or it didn't go perfectly. So what? Make an adjustment, make it happen. I think failure a lot of times is more important than success. Oh man, I can't, I completely agree. I completely agree with that. It's, that's when we're refined. You know, it's hard to be completed without, you know, seeing some chinks in the armor. You know what I mean? Without saying, oh, all right, that's, that's a pitfall right there. Okay, let me actually fill that void right here with this. And those little voids are, are points of failure many times. Like, oh man, I didn't plan to have a void there, but you do, you know? And if you want anything that's going to be a nice, refined, complete product or even person, you have to have points of just insecurity, uh, you know, an, an ideal circumstance in order to say, all right, I'm now secure because I noticed the insecure points. Yeah. Who wants to be perfect anyway? That sounds boring. It, it, it really, you know, the crazy part is like it, as, as much as we think we want perfection, that is, it, there's nowhere else to go. Right? right. There's no, there's no room for growth. I don't want, per, I do not want to be perfect, you know? And it's just, I, I, I don't want it. I don't want it. Give me some imperfection. You know what I mean? Give me some, give me some time, some areas where I can still grow. I love growth. So, you know, give me that. When you love pro ball, what was the next step that led you to Nike or was that something that was developing all along? Cause I know Nike and the, and certainly professional basketball tend to go hand in hand. Right. Yeah. It would have been nice if that was developing all along, but it wasn't, you know, for me, you know, I wanted to go into business for myself. I got my business license while I was playing abroad in Europe and in Ireland to be exact. And so, you know, I knew at some point down the road, I was going to be stepping away and, and try this transition into business, which was difficult. I, I went through depression, anxiety, all sorts of things. It was just so difficult to sit still, to be honest with you, physically, figuratively, in every way. Psychologically, it was just hard to sit, sit still and not have the adrenaline rush of competition and just being able to get the best of my, out of myself physically and mentally because you know, professional sports is a huge mental game that's played as well as just the physical. So that all that just stopped. And I'm working in a call center for Bank mm -hmm. of America. And I'm take, being yelled at by rich people about their portfolios. Like, you know, I'm like, what is this? You know, so I'm just going through these different things. Um, 
just saying, okay, I'm going to build this up. I'm going to trust the process. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to put it in God's hands. And I'm going to get my behind to work at the same time. So I would have these jobs. I had these internships I was doing. You know, some of it was a very humbling experience, you know, going from being doored in different cities across the globe and, you know, being six, eight, you know, everybody can tell, okay, you probably play basketball. Okay. You look like you're in shape, you know? So it was like, I'm getting all these basketball questions. Like, do you play? And I'm like, no, you know, and that was, that was a, t- a difficult thing for me to say. Cause I'm always used to say, absolutely. I played for this team or that team. So it was a humbling experience. But, you know, thank God I stuck with it and just continue to build it up, you know, over what was it, the next seven years before I, I, I was able to step away and do my company full time. It just it took a process. I, I was a trainer, a physical trainer for about three years. I was a teacher's assistant at a high school for four years. Again, I, I had to put pride aside, ego aside and say, look, if you're going to build up your company, as you plan and as you wrote out, you'll do, you're going to have to enjoy this process, period. And if you endure it on the other side of this thing, it's going to be something amazing. And, you know, April 3rd, 2018, I was able to step away from being a teacher's assistant and was able to do my company full time. I've been doing that ever since. And those skills certainly led into what you do now for sure a teacher's assistant oh, and your degree in psychology i read I, all those Absolutely. things were important mm-hmm. i want to talk before we get into what you do now i want to talk a minute about success because i do believe that people have this idea that success is supposed to look like this particular thing and if it doesn't look like this particular thing then it's not really success and you talked about when you were little all you wanted to do is have Jordan's career and that right. would be the pinnacle. That would be the all, the all. And exactly. your path was different. It doesn't mean that your path wasn't successful. Mm-hmm. Did you have a moment where you were able to, to go, okay, I might not be Michael Jordan this in this lifetime, but look at all this great stuff I'm doing. Yes. Fortunately, because I also had the other moments where I'm like, man, I'm not doing what I admired growing up to a T. Am I doing as great as I can? I had those moments, you know, because as an athlete, we get you get compared to others, whether you do it or not, and you fall into that trap. Um, the most elite athletes, and when you the most elite thinkers, also as an athlete, and just in the world, period, you become your own competition. You compare yourself to you or the former you, you yesterday, you this morning, because you're 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 constantly leveling up. And that's what began to happen to me while I was still competing. And that's that was the game became so much more fun and enjoyable. I stopped looking everywhere else besides myself in a mirror. I held myself more accountable, you know, and that was the best part about it was the fact that I was accountable for me. My outcome, my results, the process, I put it all on my on, on my lap. And that's what I needed as an athlete, as opposed to comparing myself to others and saying I'm trying to live up to the how somebody else is playing. Cause at that point, I'm giving myself an outlet to blame shift. Cause I'm not just being me. I'd rather blame me than blame somebody else. And for me, that was the best thing I was able I just was competing with myself, Susan. I mean, it became when I stepped away, I stepped away at the height of my career. I was, you know, I, I was my best when I stepped away. But I knew that I can apply this to my company. I'm like, I want to teach athletes this elite style of thinking and, and training and playing and competing while I'm while I'm living it. And Nike caught one of that. Nike Sports Camps caught one of that. And we, we partnered. Honestly, it was amazing. Year one of, of my business going into year two. And I put on one camp in, in New Jersey and, you know, we just, we grew over time. And, you know, my company, we now run close to 70 camps around the country and internationally. So, you know, it's, it's been a blessing just to grow and, and to see the process of it and to see the other side, because that's the most encouraging part. You know, like the fact that I've, 
I've seen multiple processes and I've seen the other side of the process. I now trust the next process that comes. It's going to be the, it's the same formula, right? It is not anything different, different that I have to do. I don't have to deviate from what I've been doing in this lane. I can apply the same principles mentality to this lane over here. And I can go ahead and attack it in that same fashion, not worry about any results or any outcomes. I could care less about an outcome. Just be so concerned and, and in tune with what I'm doing. And I'll know my the outcome is going to be a byproduct of the great job that I do. Period. And if but you know the outcome isn't ideal, I can guarantee you I still grew in the process. Do you see a lot of yourself in the kids that come through the camps? Oh, big time, especially by the end of the week. You know, a lot of the kids, they they come back. Fortunately, you know, they come back. So I, a lot of the kids, I've known them for years at this point, And I definitely see myself in those kids. You know, it, it's. I make sure that by the end of the camp week, five days later, they can adopt some part of my mentality. They will tell you, like, I, I we have talks every morning. I give them some point of, you know, uh, professional mentality and mannerism every day during a warm up. You know, it's I let them know by the end of the week. I let all the parents know when we have our commencement ceremony that this is my sneaky way of getting into their minds. It's not just about basketball. The on court is important, but I want to make sure they're successful in life. Period. Like you can apply what I'm teaching you mentality wise on the court. You can apply that to the classroom. I just told a group this past summer that, hey, look, I want you guys just to focus on where you are, like, and treat each other well. Pay attention to your coaches. You know, don't fight back at the referees every call. I let them know, like, look, one day your teammates are going to be called coworkers. Your coach is going to be called bosses or managers. Like, these referees are going to be called officers out in society. Lean into what you're going through right now because you do this well right now. And you do it with integrity, you'll be able to seamlessly step into the next part of life with just as much success. Yeah. So now that you are, you have a family. Yes, that's a do. Yeah. How old's your child? Nine years old. Nine years Nine old. Nine years old. Uh, boy or girl? Boy. Is yeah. he showing uh, signs that he wants to play basketball, or is he going a different direction? Nah, he's showing a whole lot of signs that he wants to play basketball. He's uh he's a mini me for sure. And um he's beyond my skill set where I was at nine years old. He's beyond my height already where I was at nine years old. Yeah, he, he's you know, so he, he's expressing that he wants to play in the NBA, that he wants to do great things in basketball. One thing I'm I make sure he's aware of is that he's not fooling himself. Already at this age, I just don't want him to be. I don't want him to have that point of disappointment. You know, at nine years old, he's really starting to see, okay, I have to work for some things. Like maybe not at six years old, they just think things just happen because you want them to happen. At this age, I'm now telling him, nope, you have to, you have to work for it. We had a full conversation two mornings ago, what was it, Tuesday, Monday, yesterday, um, about cause and effect. This was when we were in the car. I'm, I take him to school every morning and we had a nice conversation to call him. I, I asked him, I forget what we were talking about. I asked him if he knew what that was. He said, no. I said, well, here's what it is. I said, simply put, if you want to have an outcome, if you want this or that thing to happen, that's the effect, right? I said, whatever happens is the effect. I said, but something always makes that happen. That result happen. I said, that's the cause. I said, if you want to have, okay, we were talking about basketball, right? I said, if you want to have, you want to be great at basketball, I said, you're going to have to do some daily work toward that thing. And he, I said, look, if you want to have a great effect, your cause has to be daily input so you can have an amazing output on the other side. And he was asking me questions, which was great because I saw he was intrigued or interested. And I said, look, what do you have to do if you want to be great? He said, I, I got to do this thing. I have to do something all the time. I said, I said you love art. I said, if you want to be a great artist? I said, you should draw something every day. You know, you should try to paint something every day. I said, do that stuff. I said, I know you love art, man. Do it, do it all the time. And that way, I, I just wanted him to understand that if you want to get something out of life, you want to get something in this life, you got to work for it. What did you learn about your own father by being a father? Oh, man, that you have to be intentional. 
you know, you can't let the world teach and dare expect for them to to grow in the ways that you desire for them to grow. You you have to be intentional about what you input into them and it should be consistent. And that's one thing I learned and I'm learning as a father, the more intentional I am, again, about having conversations about cause and effect, for goodness sake. Like that's, that's an adult conversation, you know, but I know that it can be related to what he's doing now in school. Like, hey, Jaden, you want to you want to do well on that spelling test? Here's how you ha- your cause has to be. I'm going to study. So you have an amazing effect. And so that's one thing I'm, I, I would say I've learned for sure. Multiple things I've learned, but just being intentional about spewing things into them that I know now that I may not have known as a child. But I forgot I can give him a glimpse of life so that he's ahead of the ball. Do you talk to him about your childhood experiences? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So this was funny. Um, wow. This is the last week of the last day of camp we had, which is probably close to a month ago now in August. Um, me and probably about four of the coaches that are, are standing around and one of them asked, Hey, when's your book coming out? Right. And um, I'll let them know it's coming out in September. And one of the other coaches asked, well, what's in the book? And I said, you know, I, talk a good amount about my experiences, you know, personally and professionally and things I had to overcome. And I said, I just discussed a lot about my childhood. Right. So my son is standing right there. He was like, did you put this or that story in there? He starts telling a whole story about my childhood. And then he's like, yeah, y'all, y'all. I said, he's like, yeah, my dad did this, this, and that too. And he's, he starts telling four or five stories about my childhood to these coaches. They are cracking up. My son knows so much about my childhood. He knows you know, I have a book trailer that I had created, a 3D animated book trailer for my book, just to help, with, you know, with marketing. It blew up more than I thought it would. It's now being presented to different studios, but it's so it's graphic, you know, not in, in a bad way, but it shows some of the things that I, I mentioned early on, growing up in an abandoned house, witnessing a shooting, all these things are in there. So it was, you know, same, sto- you know, Toy Story style animation, but it shows my life. It shows where I am now. It shows me in, in the camp realm. You see all these, you see the death of my brother. You see divorce from my ex-wife. You see all these things that occurred that I'm transparent about because I once hid them thinking they, that exposure would make me feel weak. It would make me look weak. And it wasn't until I finally began to expose these things and I, I talked about them to where I actually felt stronger. I'm like, this is crazy. I should have been, you know, discussing things and, and reaching out to help bef- sooner. And um, yeah, but me and my son, we, we watched the trailer together. And we had a good talk after, you know, because him seeing mommy and daddy split up in the trailer, you know, I'm like, I just want to make sure he's processing things correctly and properly. And I want to make sure he's not holding things in. So let's talk about it. I know I, I would hold things in, you know, as a youth. So. He, he knows my childhood and my life, my life well. I think it's so important to tell our stories because as we do that, we, I say this a lot on the show, is that we give permission for other people to have their stories be told, or we give them permission to feel the feelings that they've maybe been afraid to have come out. Because so if true. you could survive it, if you were able to navigate it, and you, meaning the royal you or you, you know, mm-hmm. that... I think it it's it's going to bring humanity closer together. It's so easy to separate yourself from other people. The truth of the matter is we're all, we're all going through a lot of the same stuff. Exactly. That That's the amazing part. That's the amazing part. It, it, it connects us with so many others that may not be anything like us culturally or you know even financially or what what there can be a whole lot of external differences but man inside we we're going through the same insecurities the same anxieties the same human experience you know and like you just mentioned we who knows that until you express it and we need each other we need each other exactly. desperately so is it so. hard to to keep the some of the negative influence of the world outside the door, raising a child. 
I imagine that can be tricky these days. Yeah, it can be tricky. You know, it can be tricky these days. You, you still have your YouTube. You still have, you know, your internet. So it's like you just with that alone, that a lot, that like never before. So it's funny. You could shelter a child in the past successfully, right? I feel yeah. like now you, you can keep, again, before it was the, even the early 90s, you can keep the outside from coming in if you wanted to really shelter your child. It's hard to do that because now the outside is now digitally infused into the homes, you know, even by way of video games, you know, video games, YouTube, and just the internet period, apps, whatever. It's an ad. The outside comes right in through the doors. So, yeah, you know, we, we have to have talks about different things and, you know, just to let them know, like when the shoot school shootings and stuff happened last year, that was like such a it was a tough thing to have to talk about. With your kid, because number one, you don't want them going to school scared and afraid, but you want them to know. Again, this is life, you know, um, and you're protected. You know, my son, he's religious. You know, he, he we pray every night together. You know, he he knows God. He he, he trusts God. He asks God to protect us every day, every night. And I love that because for me. I could tell he's operating in the way of not trying to, he doesn't want to have to worry. He wants to know that there's a, there's a higher power that's protecting us. So we don't have to protect ourselves from the craziness that may exist. And so I'm glad he has that level of faith already to where it's like, he knows he doesn't have to handle all this stuff. You can go out there with confidence and faith, knowing I'm going to make it back home. Did you ever have a crisis of faith growing up? You said a crisis? Mm -hmm. No, no, not really. You know, I, I had moments to where I feel like the only time I questioned God was when my brother passed. Mm -hmm. You know, I experienced death before that point. I, you know, when I was six, I had a cousin who was shot and killed, you know, and it was that same year when I witnessed the shooting, you know. So it was just I, I saw death before that point, but it was never in house, you know, like it was just it hit at a different level. And so I'm like, God, like, what's going on? You know, I never questioned God or, or my faith. I'm just like, and who's next? You know, um, I had friends who were around the same time who were, who were killed. Um, before the age of 20, I had about three friends who were shot and killed. And so it just, I'm like, what's, you know, I wanted to just get away. To be honest, I wanted to, to get out of Philly. That was a big thing that even my brother Kevin and my other brother Eric, who was in the army, did two tours in Iraq. He said, look, they both told me, like, no, nope, you, you, we don't want you to stay here. We don't want you to stay in Philly when you go to school. You know, I would get recruited by St. Joe's University in Philly, Drexel. And I came home one day and some of my mail was tore up in the kitchen trash can. I was putting something in the trash and in the kitchen, I would see mail that was tore up i'm like i see like a college emblem on the corner i'm like it was one was from west point and i think one was from somewhere else and i'm like i yelled upstairs who, who tore up my mail right i'm like 15 16 years old and one of my brothers eric he said i did you're not going there <laughs> so he said so you know i think one that was a, a one that was like from west point or navy it was from somebody and he said, you're not going in there. You know, he was already in the army by that point. He was home for a bit during that time. And he said, you're not going there. And they were just really protective. They wanted to make sure I, I wasn't going to school in Philly. And I wasn't going to the army or Navy or, you know, anything like it. So, you know, um, it, it was a different time. But I, I didn't question. And I have a, a crisis of faith that often. Fortunately, it's because of my upbringing. Although you, you got to wonder, I mean, uh, I always think about having crisis of faith, I think is almost, it makes the faith stronger. It, it does. And I, I was going to say there was another point. So I was recently divorced during that time is when I, you know, during not so much getting divorced, but multiple separations, I really began questioning life and it wasn't that I questioned my faith per se, because I still knew that if I apply the same formula, you know, 
if I just stick with this stuff, if I don't give up, I, that's why I know. if I didn't give up, that things will ultimately turn around and get better. You know, no matter what the result may be, I knew that things would get better. It was just hard to see because things were really, 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 really bad, really bad. And I'm like, my goodness, like I'm doing my absolute best to have things be amazing. And they're really bad right now. And I just began searching for answers and reading as many books as I can read. And I began reading nine books every three weeks. And I was just like searching, just, just trying to just find out why are things happening the way they're happening? How can I grow at the same time? I was reading a ton of self-help and personal development books. I'm like, I can name a thousand of them at this point. And so I did have a crisis of, of just, man, how can I put it? Um, I questioned things. It wasn't that I didn't believe they could get better, but I was a skeptical of how, like, man, how is this going to get better? I was still wondering too much about it and result. And that was a problem that I had. And I had to take my mind off of an end and put myself more in that moment and say, just work on improving yourself and things will improve. When you change, the things around you will change. You don't have to worry about it. Just lean in. And that's what I began learning. So like you said, as a result of that crisis, I did become stronger. Yeah. And I mean, ultimately, in any relationship, whether it's romantic or platonic, all we really can do is is ourselves. It's the only thing we really have control over and how other people live their lives and what their choices that they make. We can try and be the best that we can be and love as strong as we can love. That doesn't always sync up with another person. Exactly. Especially when you, since you've read a ton of books, if you get into attachment styles and mm -hmm. how people feel love, how people give love, yeah. things get complicated pretty fast. Absolutely. Really? Exactly. I mean, in a major, major way, it, it's, it's amazing. You know, again, relationships are, are, are an amazing thing. You learn so much from them. And I agree. It's just like, hopefully you, you grow in the process, whether, they, you know, whether they work out or not, or not, you know, hopefully you learn something from what occurred. And that's, that's the best thing that happened for me. You know, I, I learned how to grow and accept um, change. That was the best. I was fighting against change so much. Susan, I mean, I, it was like, that was my biggest problem. I was trying to keep things the same. I'm talking about everything I could do. I wanted to stay the same. And I refused for them to change and just say, look, you know what? Just as you just mentioned, all you can really do is control yourself. You can't control the other party. You know, and it's like I had to focus on myself and just developing myself and making sure I was staying the greatest father I can be. And, you know, and at the same time, still being the greatest husband I can be until the end. <laughs> you know, and it's like that I had to put myself in the mode of saying, OK, no matter what happens, don't focus on that. Just as long as you're a husband, be the best husband you can be. And, and I think the trickiest part at the end of those sorts of things is to to wish the other person peace and love and well-being because mm -hmm. we, uh, you know, our ego wants to step in and be like, oh, you're wrong. And you know, right, you're right, going to be right. miserable without me. Right, you're right. <laughs> and look, I had every one of those thoughts. I had every one of those feelings and I felt them in a major way. But, you know, I knew, I knew that I had to not feel that way in order for me to move on. And fortunately, you know, it, it took me a little while to do, but not that long, you know, because I had a lot of people in my corner just coaching me like, hey, I reached out to people that were in my situation and I wasn't afraid to tell them what I was going through. My parents, I spoke to them, obviously, you know, their marriage, the, you know, counselors, you know, things like that. So I just reached out to so many people, received so much input, prayers, help, all the all the stuff, books, you know, people, oh, you should read this book. Yeah. And um, I, I released the hatred that I had. And that was the biggest thing I was able to forgive. And when it's, once I forgave, I, I literally just felt free. I stopped thinking about it. 
I didn't think about it as much as I did. The only time I would think about things were like, man, I feel bad for my son that he no longer has within the house mom, mommy and daddy. That was the difficult part for me. It wasn't the marital side of me fighting against that change and that, you know, adjustment. It was more so the empathetic side that I felt for my son, like, mm, man, you know, I knew how good it felt and how great it felt to have both parents in the house. I was fighting for that, but it's like, that should not be the cause or reason for marriage. And I had to accept these different things and say, okay, at this point, Joe, focus on being an amazing father, making sure mentally, spiritually, emotionally, he's covered and he's good. Yeah. And as you said, kids are resilient. They are. And they're, they are. they're very smart. I don't, mm-hmm. sometimes I think that people don't really realize, not you, but I mean, just people in general don't realize how smart kids are. That Absolutely. when you were talking about being in the car in the mornings and having these deep philosophical mm-hmm. conversations with your child, well, yeah, kids rise to whatever level yeah. you give. I completely agree. I mean, we, we last year, and we did this for two years, if not just over two years, uh, every morning before school, we read a new quote mm-hmm. while we're in the car. So I would, I made these quote cards. I have a ton of quotes that I, you know, made myself and a ton of quotes that I just, I picked up on from others that I admire. He loves karate and kung fu flicks. So I, I have a lot of Bruce Lee quotes that I put on these quote cards. It's like a vintage looking, you know, car stock paper just to make them look like they're antique. So I put them on there and, you know, we have a stack of them in the car, in the truck. And I said, all right, pick a new card. Let's read it. So it was us practicing reading and comprehension for him too. So we will go over the quote. He has to break down what he think it means. And we would discuss it. This is first grade, second grade, you know, second grade actually with the pandemic. So it was like first grade. And then it was like, you know, the portion of third grade last year, he's a fourth grade now. And I'm like, we're going about to restart that since he just started school last week. Um, it's helped him a lot because he, he, philosophizes his own things he, yeah. his 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 mindset is beyond his years because you hear him break things down like well maybe this is happening because of he's thinking of the becauses he's thinking about again cause and effect he's aware of it but he didn't really know how to define it i can mm-hmm. tell mm-hmm. and so yeah i'm just trying to be intentional with those things and like you said he's the kids are, kids are smart like if you give yeah, if you give them that high bar they can reach it if you lower it they'll also reach that but it's like why not make them stretch and reach a little bit? Absolutely. So what's coming next? What's on the docket for with the books just come out? It sounds like maybe there's a TV show in the works. That would be awesome. I, I would love for that to happen. Can't say too much just yet, but I would love for, you know, something amazing to come as a result of the trailer. Uh, it, it does tell a great story. And, um, you know, it's I feel like it can have an amazing impact on people um at the same time which is why i had it created just so people can get a visual everyone's not a reader so I feel, hey, let me make something to where people can get a visual and maybe intrigue them enough to maybe read the book or even listen to the book you know so um for myself next up you know is just to really you know get this book out there to as many people as possible and just to really have it impact them speak it from the stages i've been doing but now with even more detail and just um just want to change lives i mean that's that's my main thing and just you know enjoy everything while i'm doing it that's why we're here absolutely absolutely joel tell people where they can find you your website instagram type things yeah you can find me on uh joelbgreen.com you can find me there um i have a lot of my business information there if you want to get in touch with me in regards to speaking you know speaking engagements with your company school university uh, you can also find me on uh, Instagram at jgreenplt. That's J A Y Green P L T. Uh, also on Facebook, Joel Green Official, TikToks of the world, all of these things. So you can find me on all <laughs> these platforms. Um, and again, I, I love to interact and engage with you all. That's I, I get my high off of that when I'm on social media, not just going on and scrolling. But I love interacting with people and seeing where I can help as well. Is the website the best place for people to get the book or is Amazon the best place? Amazon is the best place to get the book now. The world okay. Amazon and Barnes and Noble, wherever your preference is. I know people tend to navigate toward Amazon. I know I do many times. Um, and again, 
you can find it on there get yourself and your friend a copy uh again i'm already getting some great feedback from people which i'm like wow this is awesome um by my faith i expected it but it's still surreal to experience i'll be honest just to see people sending me these ex excerpts from the book highlighted and all these screenshots that I, I have endless at this point in this selfies and screenshots of people reading my book and it feels so good just to know that it's helping people so you know i hope that it helps you guys so you get yourself a copy and please leave a review not for sake of and again i know it's big on algorithms for amazon i'm big on feedback that's how i get better so i'm always seeking out hey what do you think about my camp i ask the kids i ask the parents what do you think about my camp i mean tell me honestly what you think and just so i can improve my camps and my my business and so i would love to hear what you guys think about the book and you know whether it helped you or or anything so hope it helps you guys though yeah i'll put links to everything on heyhumanpodcast.com to make it really easy for people to just go to one place and see all of your info awesome yeah thank you so much for being on the show no, thank you thanks Susan. i appreciate it thanks for listening everybody Bye. Rate, review, and subscribe to Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Bye.